This is the American Law Journal. The U.S. Supreme Court has taken up gay marriage again, and most believe it's a done deal, that in a short time, same-sex marriage will indeed become the law of the land. Good evening. This is the American Law Journal. And how the justices have framed the questions in this legal argument suggest that there may be more at stake than simply gay marriage. The legal intelligencer's Gina Passarella reports. On April the 21st, 1975, Richard and I were legally married in Boulder, Colorado. There was nothing in the Colorado Marriage Code that would prohibit me from issuing a marriage license to two people of the same sex, so I did. Tony is an Australian citizen. He is seeking to be permitted to stay in this country as the spouse of an American citizen. In 1975, long before the term gay marriage became part of America's vocabulary, Anthony Sullivan and Richard Adams applied for, and were granted, a license to marry in the state of Colorado. When authorities challenged that union, a young judge ruled that Anthony and Richard could not stay together as married in the United States. History tells a story of great irony, because that judge would someday play the most pivotal of roles for LGBT rights across the country. The American history of gay rights, from Kinsey's studies, to the New York Stonewall riots, to San Francisco politician Harvey Milk, is inextricably bound to the Supreme Court. In the late 1950s, the U.S. Postal Service refused to deliver a gay bisexual magazine known as One, the FBI claiming it obscene. The Warren Court took the case, overturning two lower court decisions and marking the first time the Supreme Court ruled in favor of homosexuals. But that would be the last decision furthering gay rights for almost 40 years. The history of the treatment of same-sex couples has evolved tremendously over the last several decades. In 1972, the Supreme Court actually reviewed a same-sex marriage case. It was a case called Baker v. Nelson. Two men had tried to obtain a marriage license in Minnesota. The Supreme Court dismissed their case outright in a one-sentence opinion that just said, there's not even a federal question here, right? That the idea of same-sex marriage was so fundamentally sort of absurd to the court. You then fast forward to 1986, right, to Bowers versus Hardwick, which isn't a marriage case. It's a case about the right to engage in same-sex sexual conduct. A gay man who had literally been arrested for having sex with another man in his house. In 1986, the Supreme Court found that that was perfectly fine. By the 90s, there was a hint of change. Hawaii considered legalizing gay marriage, but only briefly. Even the election of Democrat Bill Clinton didn't help the LGBT community much, at least legally. One of the interesting things about gay marriage is that in 1996, Bill Clinton passed DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act, saying marriage should just be between one man and one woman. So when you look at the time frame from... But then enter Supreme Court Justice Anthony Kennedy, the same Anthony Kennedy who 20 years earlier, as a Colorado Circuit Court judge, denied Anthony Sullivan and Richard Adams the chance to stay as a married couple in the United States. A Reagan appointee, a conservative judge, but apparently, by the 1990s, not so conservative on certain social issues. Justice Kennedy has really staked his legacy on building these cases around gay rights, starting with Romer v. Evans in 1996, Lawrence v. Texas in 2003, United States v. Windsor in 2013. All of those decisions are pro-gay rights. Really a watershed moment for LGBT people. Justice Kennedy's three sort of LGBT-friendly opinions. Kennedy wrote the majority opinion in all three cases, overturning anti-gay statutes, ending sodomy laws, even rejecting Bill Clinton's Defense of Marriage Act, and leading to the landmark case now before the high court. So the Supreme Court's going to have to make a de determination as to the constitutionality of a gay couple marrying. I think it pretty much is a foregone conclusion that they're going to say, yes, there is a federal constitutional right to same-sex marriage, and that's going to apply in all 50 states. And while I love Justice Kennedy, and you know, they joke that he loves two things, 
gay rights, and states' rights. Which may explain why the questions posed by the court in this case are framed as state duties, not as equal rights protections or due process, leading some to believe the Roberts Court, through the voice of Justice Kennedy, will further safeguard gay rights, but only as it relates to marriage. He did not go the route of saying that sexual orientation is, like sex or race, a protected class. And there's a lot of advocates, including me, who think he should go that route. The federal government doesn't have anti-discrimination laws around employment. Discrimination in housing, in schooling, that is allowed in most places in this country and is not banned by federal law. So marriage is coming before those advancements, which still need to happen. Many legal scholars believe that same-sex marriage will be a reality in all states by the end of this term, courtesy of the Roberts Court. That collective sigh of relief you hear may not just be from the plaintiffs in the cases, but from family law practitioners who will finally have a uniform definition of what constitutes a valid marriage in the United States. For the American Law Journal, I'm Gina Passarella. All right, three guests uh, join me on the program tonight. Don Spry is a family law practitioner with King Spry, Herman Freund and Fall. He has been providing legal commentary for us here at ALJ for over 25 years. Professor John Colhane is the co-director of Family Health Law and Policy Institute at Widener Law in Delaware. And Helen Casal hails from the law firm of Hangley Aronchick in Philadelphia. She argued the Whitewood case that made same-sex marriage legal in Pennsylvania. We're not taking your telephone calls tonight, but if you want some more information on any topic we tackle here, write to us at info at lawjournaltv.com. I want to show some video that, that Don and I conducted back in the 1990s. Our hairstyles have changed a bit. Take a look. <laughs> but most people know that when it comes to full faith and credit in this country, if you're married in one state, another state must recognize the validity of that marriage. So when Hawaii started clamoring, ah, we're going to accept gay marriages, I think Utah was the first one uh, on the boat that said, no, 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 we don't care what other states do. That we're not going to accord full faith and credit. Is this what Pennsylvania did, Don? This is a preemptive strike? The general rule is that states will give full faith and credit to other states' judgments or orders, uh, except now for same-sex marriages. And Congress, there's a federal law, Defense of Marriage Act, which um, says that states can define marriage and do not have to give full faith and credit. How old is I think the funniest thing looking back on that program, other than the hairstyles, of course, <laughs> is that you had a sense that maybe same-sex marriage would be, if you will, approved uh, by the states sometime in your lifetime. Our partner, if you will, on that program, uh, Mr. Harold Funt, I remember, looked at us like we had a third eye uh, showing because I, th I think he and many other people felt, why are you even discussing this? And yet, over time, we've seen that there is progression in society. So doesn't the Supreme Court, at the end of the day, respond to progression of the people and where the public goes to? Doesn't the Supreme Court ultimately have to pay attention to public opinion? Well, I, I, I think so. Um, I mean, Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal, was a case that was on the wrong side of history. And some commentators feel that um, Justice Roberts doesn't want his court to be on the wrong side of history. I don't think this court's been in front. I think it's following. Um, but I, in my opinion, it'll get there. I'm sure Professor Cohane and Helen would know more about that than I do. Yeah, I think it's interesting because you, you look at, back I think it was 1996, 25% of the population approved of same-sex marriage. Right. And when Windsor was, was argued in 2013, the Supreme Court was aware that there was this trend moving forward to for approval of same-sex marriage, and they knew that that was happening. So, I mean, going back to your issue about, you know, was this kind of a stepping stone? Was Windsor the stepping stone for same-sex marriage, or was it the loving decision? And, and I think that the Supreme Court knew that this was just a stepping stone for them, and it wasn't quite what we need it. What's not the Brown versus Board of Education, it's not the loving. This case coming that's going to be argued now is going to be that decision. Let me uh, tack along on that point, Helen, because I think the Supreme Court punted two years ago. I felt they had the perfect opportunity to deal with not only DOMA, the Prop 8 case, which again would have been a little bit like Roe versus Wade or Loving versus Virginia, which, hey, it, it, it's, it's time to fall in line. Now, some constitutional experts would say, well, that's not the job of the Supreme Court. They're not there you know, to pull us into the future. The Warren Court would argue with that. 
it's interesting because if you listen to the arguments during Windsor and during the Prop 8 case, there were these questions from the justices about, uh, you know, what public opinion was about same-sex marriage. And they knew that there was this trend, but it wasn't there yet, and they weren't ready. I, I agree with you. On some level, they punted, and they weren't ready. But I think they also knew that at some point, this was going to be inevitable. Do you think but so? But now, isn't it easier? Isn't it easier because we have now 37 states that have approved same-sex marriage, and we have now, what is it, 59 percent of the population that approves of same-sex yeah, marriage? And maybe, Professor Culhane, uh, this, this, we get into a polemical argument about what the role of the Supreme Court is. My point is this. Didn't the Supreme Court know this was going to come up, that they were going to be faced with this again, and don't they look kind of old and behind history because they merely pushed down the road the inevitable? Did they think it wasn't going to come up again? Well, I'm sure they knew it was going to come up. And in fact, if you look at the Windsor decision, uh, now with almost two years hindsight, it's very obvious what Justice Kennedy was doing in his majority opinion, which was to cede the ground for uh, subsequent uh, courts to say, you know, Windsor really is about the dignity and equality of uh, same-sex couples and their children. And even though the case itself was only about this federal piece of legislation, there's so much broad language in there uh, that it really gave courts the ammunition to uh, take this a step further. And if you look at it, the reason we have 37 states, many of those states, uh, this was not accomplished legislatively. This was accomplished by courts that, uh, I guess took a hard look at Windsor and then decided that that case really was about not just the federal piece of legislation, but about the dignity and equality of same-sex couples under both the Equal Protection and the Due Process Clause. So, so in a sense, the court kind of set itself up for this case two years later. And if you look at Justice Scalia's dissent, he's apoplectic about this. He sees this coming. There's another dissent by Justice Roberts that says, no, 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 this is just about the rights of states to decide for themselves, and the federal legislation, you know, is sort of a, uh, I guess, sort of a counter to that, and that's against our history. But uh, Justice Scalia saw it more clearly as uh, one major step down the road toward full same-sex marriage in all 50 states, and I think he's going to turn out to be right. You know, as you mentioned, our firm had represented um, the, the plaintiffs in the, the Whitewood decision, which yes. is a same-sex marriage case in Pennsylvania. Right. And I have to be honest, yes. I never yes. thought we'd see it here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> I never thought that that would happen. And so going back to, you know, what you said about your program back in the 90s, uh, I don't think there were so many people that thought it would happen so quickly after Windsor was decided. Right. Right. And so I think you're right. On some level, the Supreme Court never thought that they would have to address this issue. But here they are. And Professor Colhane, in some ways, the Supreme Court has tipped their hand, uh, the questions that they're asking, what they just did in Alabama recently. Tell us a little bit about this and why I think you believe this Supreme Court, in some way, shape, or form, is going to, quote, unquote, approve of same-sex marriage across all 50 states. Well, if they were poker players, they just had a big tell, and that was in not stopping the marriages in Alabama and letting them go forward, right? So now they've taken a case, they're going to resolve the issue, and subsequent to their decision to take this case from the Sixth Circuit, they decide to allow same-sex marriages to proceed in the state of Alabama, right? And recently in the state of Florida. And the uh, normal procedure would be to stay those cases and to stay those marriages and uh, not let them proceed until the case is resolved. There was a strong dissent from Justices uh, Thomas and Scalia, where Justice Thomas says, uh, you know, this is really not the appropriate way to proceed. We should respect the decision of the people of Alabama as expressed through their, their state constitutional process, unless and until we decide differently. So it really is almost an admission by Justice Thomas that he knows exactly which way the wind is blowing. And I think it would be a major surprise if now the court would say, we're just kidding about Alabama. All you people have gotten married. Uh, sorry about that, but those marriages have to be unraveled or at least placed in some kind of weird state of limbo. I, I just don't think that's very likely to happen at all. And that wouldn't just happen in Alabama. I mean, that would happen in these other 37 states. In where these, yeah, yeah, where these other individuals have now been able to get married. And and like like Professor Colleen said, it's going to completely unravel all of those marriages and put them in a total state of flux. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, what, Don, what you think 
but for your practice, that's going to be a real mess Absolutely. for family lawyers. Yeah, it's been a mess. Uh, you know, people in Pennsylvania, same-sex couples that can be married in Pennsylvania, if they travel to Michigan, they're not married. So something happens out there, and you don't have and you have uh, you don't have a second parent adoption. You're not looked upon as a parent. Uh, there's all kinds of issues, medical issues. Uh, it, it, it's a, it's a, just a those those U.S. citizens in those states have clearly different rights or lack of rights right. as compared to the people in the other states. That's the problem I think that the Supreme Court's facing. Yeah, and even now in, in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, we have um, marriage equality. I'm still providing the information or the, the advice to my clients that if you are a, a same-sex couple and you are having a child, you still need to go through that adoption process. Mm -hmm. And they often say, well, why? Because, you know, I'm, we're married and, and there should be no reason. We're both the legal parents. But that's not the case because, as Don just said, they travel to a state like Michigan or another state that doesn't recognize their marriage, then they could run into some real problems. So it's, it's very important until we have marriage equality throughout the country, which hopefully we'll have by the end of the Supreme Court term, they still have to go through those extra steps in order to protect their rights. And again, I think the Supreme Court knows this is going to happen. They have to go with the tide of history. I think what they're concerned about is what's going to be the fallout. So tell me, attorneys and professor, why did they shape and frame the questions that are going to be before this court in this argument the way they did? Because there are a lot of jaundiced opinions out there that say the Supreme Court is stacking the deck against gay marriage as it has framed the issue. Ilya Shapiro, we've had on this program, said that you can tell as much about the way a Supreme Court is going to handle a matter by their questions as much as their answers. There are some commentators that feel that um, Justice Roberts uh, does not want to be on the wrong side of history. He's the chief justice of the court, and that whatever is happening in the background to try to get the best opinion, mm -hmm. and then the question becomes, how will he vote? I think he'll vote in the majority, but... <laughs> Maybe he'll be like President Obama. He will have evolved on the issue. Well, it's interesting. You know, when Helen was talking about Pennsylvania, and, and Helen would know this better than I, and perhaps Professor Cohane, but I think... Um, Judge Jones was a moderate Republican appointed by Bush. That is correct. So yes. you're not talking about, I mean, you're talking about a real mainstream. No, and a lot of these federal court decisions that have been decided at the district court level have been by Republican appointees. So, mm -hmm. and, and again, I think the Supreme Court realizes that and understands it. It's been, you know, across the board, Democrats and Republicans making these decisions. But, right. I mean, you know, going back to your question about why is the Supreme Court framed the questions this way, I'd love to hear from Professor Colling to see what he thinks, because he's the constitutional <laughs> scholar. I was just going to ask but, him but, next. But, okay, but I, I think that, um, you know, it's... My understanding, it's odd that the Supreme Court has rephrased the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so that's odd in and of itself. And, and you're right. You could look at seven different blogs, and they'll give you seven different reasons as to why. I, I mean, my opinion is that they've simplified it so that uh, perhaps they don't have to go to the next step, which is gay rights in general and determining whether or not they have to look at heightened scrutiny. They don't yes. have to go down that road. That, yes. That's my opinion. Professor Colain, as, as we know, there are protections. We call them Title VII protections and protects us at the workplace, at restaurants, going to hotels, etc. That if we are a person of color or we espouse a certain religion, uh, or our gender, we're not going to be discriminated against. We know that there's no protection for sexual orientation under Title VII. So do you think the Supreme Court is hyper-aware and hyper-concerned about the fact that if all of a sudden we look at this as an equal protection argument and we say you've got to treat gays the same way you would heterosexuals, they're afraid it's going to get outside and all of a sudden we're looking that, at that as a Title VII discrimination in the workplace issue? Well, perhaps. I mean, look, it's got to be something, right? It's got to be either equal protection or due process. And the way the court framed it, it is an odd framing. And they took the framing I discovered after looking through some of the amicus briefs, which is, you know, anyone's idea of a good time. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I discovered that they had gotten the wording from an amicus brief written by a group of conservative uh, scholars. So. When I first saw that, I, I, I thought, well, maybe the court is going to surprise us and, and sort of rule in a different way. Uh, now I think, though, that they did that, as Helen suggests, so that they can frame it as an equal protection argument, but under conditions where it looks more at the state's rights versus the individual and says something like, well, the state doesn't really have a rational basis for 
uh, withholding uh, marriage licenses. So I think it will be an equal protection argument, but I don't think the court is going to go to this heightened level of scrutiny. And that way, the opinion and the language in the opinion can't be so easily parlayed into other areas of law. So I think you're right about that. And sort of a corollary to this, though, is that you know, uh, gay marriage or same-sex marriage or marriage equality is not going to solve uh, workplace problems for same-sex couples. It's not going to solve housing problems. It really solves one very particular problem. And you've got this paradox in states like Pennsylvania where same-sex couples can now marry, but there's no workplace protection. <coughs> so in right. theory, somebody could uh, a marry on a, on a Saturday, on Monday come into the office and put a wedding picture you know, on his desk or on her desk and get fired. And there's nothing in the law that prevents that. So it resolves one major issue, but there will still be many issues coming down the road. Right. So getting back to my question before, because Supreme Courts have faced this issue many times, and you've got to think that, that even the conservative end of the court realizes the die is cast and they have to do it. I mean, it is a sobering thought, and it's good for lay people to know this as well, that the Supreme Court does hear us. And, and even if you're in a corner where there's no choice left, and again, I don't know how, how mindful the court is of its place in history. This is almost the least it could do at this point in time. I think they would be, let's face it, if they were to overturn all of this and say, okay, Massachusetts and Hawaii and the, the other 37 of you, uh, you had it wrong right from the get-go. We're basically pulling the plug on gay marriage. What would be the outcome? in this country. Chaos. Yeah, I think it, it, total chaos. I mean, going back to the issue that we already discussed about these individuals that have gotten married, they've been issued marriage licenses, they've they've gotten married and they've been, you know, granted these benefits that they were that are associated with marriage. All of that would now be defunct. Uh, I mean, they would now be, t those rights would now be taken away. So it's even worse. They never had them right. before. Now they had them, and now we're going to take them away. Right. That's what uh, happened in Prop 8, right. by the way, right? right. So right. initially, yeah. until That's the Supreme right. Court decided that the parties didn't have standing to appeal, what you had in Prop 8 was California Supreme Court saying same-sex couples have a right under the California Constitution to marry. Prop 8 then passes a few months later, and you had, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of Californians who were married and whose marriages were in a state of legal limbo. And one of the questions the California Supreme Court had to decide was whether those marriages were still valid. And the court said, yes, they were. But then you had, you know, people that could marry and people who, who couldn't marry. So it was a very strange situation. And I'd be very surprised if the court would countenance such a thing right on a national uh, right basis or level. I just can't see that happening. What does history say about this particular decision? That if it goes the way we think it's gonna go? I think they would say they got it right, but they're not courageous. I think that's right. And there's a cynical view out there that the court and maybe even Justice Roberts is going to side with the uh, you know, sort of a tide of history here, uh, and at the same time, they're going to pull the plug on the Affordable Care Act, or effectively do that, and that this will provide some kind of cover for you know, that decision. That's a whole other show, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> but, but there is that theory out there that Justice right. Roberts may be trying mm -hmm. to buy some political cover by doing this. And, it, and the fact that we're even talking about the court in these political terms, I think, is pretty interesting. And I think the wool has been sort of taken off people's eyes. And people realize that the court is a very, uh, very much a political body at this point. And I do think the court on gay rights issues, though, uh, in spite of coming to this one a bit late, will be seen as having done a tremendous amount of heavy lifting. And most of that because of Justice Kennedy, who is really almost as conservative as Justice Scalia Absolutely. on many issues, Absolutely. but on gay rights issues, he's right. sort of the right. Thurgood Marshall right. of right of the right. Uh, court. And it's been interesting from that perspective. Yes. I, I mean, I'll tell you, I think, I mean, I agree with Don and I agree with Professor Colhane that um, it's... You can call me John, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I have to call you Professor. Uh, <laughs> but if, um, if, I think that th they'll make the right decision and it'll be seen as the right decision, but they got to the party late. But if they hadn't framed the questions the way that they did, mm -hmm. and if, if they went above and beyond where I think they should go, which is that this issue really deserves the scrutiny of heightened scrutiny, that would be very different. 
And that would be a courageous type decision. But I don't right. think they're going to go there. So I think it is getting to the party late, and right. that's about it. All right, time for the crystal ball. Just have to look into it. Uh, and again, we know, we think we know what the issues are. But who knows what comes up in argument. What's the decision going to be, uh, Don? And, and let's hear a vote on this one, too. In other words, you don't have to name names as far as which justice is going to go what way. But what do you think the, the final outcome will be on this? I, I think that uh, the uh, DOMA statutes will be ruled unconstitutional. And I think that and I might be wrong, and I'd be interested in Helen and uh, John's view on this. Is I, I think um, Roberts is going to rule with the majority. Interesting. So you look at it as being six to three. Yes. Gotcha. Helen, your thoughts? I say five four. I do not have that much confidence in Justice Roberts, <laughs> Chief Justice Roberts. Uh, John, Professor John well, Culhane, your thoughts? I'm going to hedge my bets, and I'm going to say it's going to be five people in the majority and Justice. Uh, Roberts uh, writing a separate weird concurrence that no one can predict, uh, but I think it'll be six to three, but I don't think he will join the majority opinion. I think he will find some narrower basis for decision. That's my guess. Okay, and I think I mentioned to you, Don, a few weeks ago, actually right before the Supreme Court said that they were going to take this case. It's so funny because we were talking about it, and the next day they said, oh, we're going to go ahead and, and take this case. I said, thing. yeah, I was... <laughs> We were a little prescient there, but six to three is, is what I think uh, uh, the final vote will be. So let's, let's, uh, let's wait and see what happens. We'll take a look at this again in June. I want to thank my three guests for joining me tonight. Don Spry with King Spry, Herman Freund and Fall, over 30 years practicing family law. Professor John Colhane, once again joining us uh, from Widener University School of Law. And Helen Casal, hailing from Hangley Aaron Chicken Center, City, Philadelphia. Thanks for joining us, Helen. And for all of us here at the American Law Journal, thanks for joining us on this Monday night. Until next week, case closed. This week's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by Law Catalyst, legal media and marketing for lawyers. Go to lawcatalyst.com. Blank Rome, providing strategic advice for employers in today's workplace. King Spry, serving its Pennsylvania clients in family law, business, personal injury, and school law for over 30 years. Beatty, Sloan, and DeGeneva, personal attention for those hurt at work or suffering from serious injury. Leventhal, Sutton, and Gornstein, we have your social security disability case covered. Polanski and Polanski, former U.S. government counsel, representing those seeking Social Security disability benefits. Scheller, P.C., protecting consumer rights since 1977. And the Legal Intelligencer, an American lawyer media company, and the oldest daily legal newspaper in the United States.